beautiful concept by a famous philosopher and mathematician Sir Taylor and which is Taylor series expansion. So I'll not go uh, directly to the mathematical aspect of this. We'll see three different aspects to Taylor series expansion. One will be philosophical aspect, other will be from application point of view and the third will be the mathematics which is involved. So let's start like this. So Taylor series at the core level is fundamentally speaking about you can represent almost many functions or a vast variety of functions with the collections of polynomials. So let's say we have polynomials. So it can be constant x square. We'll have some bunch of x plus 2, x square plus x cubed by 3. Maybe we'll have x plus x square by 2 plus x cubed by 6 and so on and so forth. So this we have set of sets of polynomials. Right, so Taylor series bridges the gap between these polynomials and nicely defined continuous functions. So let's say sine x, cos x, e to the power x, and blah blah blah, many more. Fundamentally, what it tells is you can represent a function. Let's take an example of sine x in terms of collections of these polynomials. So maybe we'll be able to represent sine x as something plus something times x plus maybe something times x square plus something else times x cubed by 3 and so forth so forth. So basically Taylor series talks about like it is possible and that's a very strong statement because as a mathematician you have to first prove the existence of this statement. Will it always be true that a particular mathematical structure can be represented at sum of some powers of the polynomials okay so sum of power series it bridges the gap between a functions which can be a general function like sin x cos x to the power x 10 x and inverse x and this set of chunks which are available in this polynomial basket it tries to express let's say crazily sin x in terms of this polynomial connection so maybe sin x may be written as something some constant plus something x plus something square plus something x cubed by 3 and something before we go and head in a mathematical aspects let's first feel like why we doubt like even it is possible because we know constant graph is going to be something like this you will see y equal to x it will go y equals x square will be something like this similarly we'll have y equal to x cube similarly we have y equal to x cube so i'm not drawing up to the scale just for the field we'll have y equal to x force and so on and so forth now we know like if you multiply all this graph with some constant so multiplying let's say x square with a constant will just scale it up or down so it will make it more relaxed or more compressed so if this is x square this is going to be 2x square this is maybe x square by 2 and so on and so forth so if you multiply a curve by a number here like these chunks by any number it's going to just contact or relax so we can always take a proper contraction and relaxation term so as to generate this sin x now it makes at least a little sense because uh, what matters is you know like sin x is going to repeat right sin x is going to be a repeating curve so we want some terms to grow. Let's say y equal to x is growing. At the same time, we want other terms to decline so that the overall effect will be something growing too fast and something is dying too fast. So when we'll add them up, maybe they'll try to saturate to some level. So this is the fundamental idea. So let me make it more clear. So let's say if some curve is going, let's say y equal to x is quite this term. When you multiply with some factor, it still goes fast. Right, so x cube will go fast, something like this. If I'll take all these copy center positive, so everything is trying to assist itself in the positive half. So let's see one of the very crude way of looking at this. Uh, if we want every curve, let's say x square, x cube, x4, x5, and even if you multiply by some factor, in the positive 
x axis side all these are trying to help each other so the overall summation no matter with what factor you multiply is always trying to grow and that can never produce sin x because we want that curve to be slapped we want it to grow sometimes then it should go down again it should go up so we want a proper slapping factor kind of thing where this curve should go up and it should not go beyond a certain limit immediately it should come down and again you are we can't afford it to go down too much so it should go up and down you know frequently the same thing is going to happen in negative side we are fortunate because x cube maybe is trying to pull it down and this even power x square x4 is trying to pull it up but now we can't put a very high coefficient uh, of our for x cube because if let's say x cube coefficient is made very high let's say 5 or 10 then it will go too down and maybe uh, this x square and x4 is not uh, capable enough or powerful enough to lift it too much because otherwise uh, again somewhere the graph will slip down so that's uh, still we don't want we want it to be down but again after a while it should come up and down and so on and so forth so now we know at least it make basic sense like uh, for every odd degree term we want to divide it by some you know like very strong factor so that it doesn't go down further at the same time we don't want even the positive term to go up rapidly yeah. even if it goes rapidly we want the negative term or the term which is below the x axis should also decay rapidly so as to balance and offset the you know uh, their growth and somehow they balance themselves to create sin x so telling so uh, basically what i mean is this right so we have uh, i have taken one very simple example let's say if you just take three terms uh, y equals uh, x and x square y x square and x cube so let's say if i just uh, take some random three terms x x square and x cube so if you add just x plus x square plus x cube clearly all three is going to you know add up and little bit fortunate will be in the negative direction because we expect like this is at least trying to saturate but at this time we are completely going up so this cannot be a good approximation of sin x right so it's totally worst approximation because in the positive side all this is trying to assist each other so we want some guy to grow at the same time we want the x cube and all odd part of polynomial to decay and the tug of war must be there so as to the they offset each other okay so what taylor proposed is let's say if i'm able to write sin x as some polynomial so let's say a naught plus a1x plus a2x square and so on k infinity so let's say suppose if you are able to write sin x in as a infinite summation of this polynomial then we'll be comfortably able to get these terms a naught a1 a2 getting in terms fundamentally reveals like how powerful these terms should be so as you don't grow too much neither you decay too much right it's easy to calculate or not because you can put x equals zero since we trust that sin x would be equivalently represented in this form so it behaves as identity so that gives a naught as zero what about a1 you can differentiate it so cos x equals a1 because the next term will be 2 a2 x and so on and so forth and now you keep x equals zero and we have a1 equals one so there is very cool way of restoring all these coefficients right a naught becomes zero a1 is one what about a2 so we can just differentiate this expression twice which means i can differentiate now this new expression so minus sine x equals 2 a2 in next expression you can see we'll have x or something now you put again x zero so we got a2 at zero right i'll do for one more term so we have a3 x cube and so on and so forth so if i'll differentiate i repeat the same process put x equals zero again we have minus one by six equals eight uh, we can clearly see the genetics of six because six is coming from two into three next term will have you know like four into three into two into one that you can see clearly by pattern so it can be done as one by three factorial so if we plug all these values there uh, it's not surprising that the expansion that we are getting for sin x is first term is missing we have x minus x square term is missing so x cubed by 3 factorial 
you can try for next to convince yourself x5 by 5 factorial minus x7 by sin factorial and so on and so forth. Now let's try to make sense of this and this is what I was trying to tell you. Clearly we know sin 0 is 0. For the simple reason if the angle dies what will die is the perpendicular. So by definition sin theta is p by h and p is dying when theta is dying. So it will give 0 and it works because sin 0 equals 0 to 0. 0 equals 0 is pretty fine. What about the next term? So basically what it's telling is I can approximate sin x almost as x in a very near vicinity of 0 because when x is very close to 0 tending to 0 the contribution of tending to 0 whole cube by 3 factorial will be too less it will be too low. So when x is too close to 0 I can almost assume like sin x is behaving just like y equal to x just in the close vicinity okay and this gives birth to the limit concept as well sin x by x behaves like 1 or its limit is exactly 1 it's time to approach to 1 when x is closer to 0 but this you can't do when x is a little bit far because then the contribution of the second term will also start uh, you know acting on the entire system similarly when x is a little bit more large x5 by 5 vectorial is also having serious contribution in term. philosophically what you can see is if you see just RHS, y equal to x is trying to increase you from minus infinity to infinity. What about x cubed by 3 factorial? So x cubed by 3 factorial graph will be something like this. 3 factorial is just a way to drag this graph down. Okay. Similarly, we'll have uh, x5 by 5 factorial. So x5 by 5 factorial is going up. Something like this. Now, if I add all the terms, suppose instead of this minus, if plus would have been everywhere in the x series expansion, it will be clearly wrong, wrong because if all these graphs are added, they will be having constructive interference. I mean like at a particular x, all these heights will add and it will grow more. Similarly, at a particular y value, all these heights will be less and it will go further. So it's deviating too much from sin x. And that makes sense why you have alternate plus and minus because every time y equal to x is trying to lift you, y equal to minus x cubed by 3 factorial will be completely reverse of this graph, right? So something is lifting you, the other part is trying to drag you down. Now since y equal to x is lifting you not very violently, but x cube is dragging you too fast. So we want the denominator of x cube to be something which is really powerful. But still, if you make it too powerful, then it still will be dragged, right? Because if x cubed by, let's say, instead of 3 factorial, we have 5 factorial. Then the decay will be a bit more slow than the growth of y equal to x. So we have to somewhere, you know, like compensate between the growth and the decay. Again, if I just take two terms, it will still deviate. Because now it has uh, decayed a little bit more than what was required. So we need to again add something to restore. Again, when we are restoring, we have seen like the, it's going little bit above sin x. So we want something again to, you know, like restore it back to sin x. So it's like basically we have a thread and something is pulling you up and, you know, some other factors is pulling you down and you have some coefficient which shows like how powerful you are being pulled up and down and then we are trying to offset this decay and growth. And that is very beautifully captured by this. So what you can see is if I'll just take three terms of the RHS. So this will be the deviation. It will try to follow the graph to a certain degree of accuracy. If we'll take five terms, it's following sine x to a longer length. If it is seven terms, it's trying to follow. Again, if it is nine terms, you see it's following sine x to a longer length. It's not up to the scale, but this gives you a feel. Again, when n is 11, so you if you take 11 terms, it's following is still longer. So more and more number of terms you take, you'll start haunting towards sine 1 or hunting towards sine 1 more closely, okay? So when n is almost theoretically infinite, then basically we expect the area to be almost 0. And if you'll add up the whole RHS chunk, it will exactly, uh, you know, like follow this sine x curve. Because these guys are trying to pull you up. Something is trying to pull you down and you are balanced in what? A very neat and clean diagram is shown for the first five terms here. 
So this red guy is sin x. If we drop draw it for the first type five terms, we'll see how closely it is approximating. Okay, so after this region, of course, like there is a deviation of these graphs. That deviation is obvious because x9 will increase too rapidly, right? For x which is away from origin, the growth of x9 will be too high. And that's why the entire system will be highly influenced by x9 coefficient. So after a while, you see the graph is completely pulled because it's fundamental law of nature, survival of the fittest. X9 is the more po most powerful guy and is lifting the entire system. Similarly, for a negative region, since x9 will behave as an odd function. So when x is negative, it will decay too fast and that influences there when x is too large. When x is near by origin, the influence of x9 is not much. That's why you see when x is near by origin, this x9 influence will be a little bit less. Similarly, x7 will be better than 9, but lesser than that. So mostly influence is coming from the first few terms rather than the last term. So in the beginning, near about x, first few terms will contribute more on the system. As you move away from the x, the latter term will contribute more. That's why as you move away from the x, the coefficient of higher powers must be very strong in denominator. So as to drag it very fast. That's still shown for the first uh, just four terms here. You know, like, and that's still shown for the just first few terms. Third term, x, x cubed by 3 factorial plus x, 5 by 5 factorial. So you can see x is trying to pull you up minus x cubed by 3 is trying to pull you down again x5 is trying to pull you up and a tug of war is like to a quite uh, beautiful degree of accuracy around origin the curve tries to follow sin x and still it's deviating once you go away from origin so i hope like it made a sense of what a get to tiller series is uh, but what i have not shown is the existence because for fairly vast number of functions it's always possible that uh, these uh, shine cos e to the power x and many algebraic functions or exponential or trigonometric function can be well represented in form of infinite power series expansion. Uh, one philosophical aspect of Taylor series is basically it's talking about if you know the information at t equal to 0, you can predict the information at any time t equals t. What I mean is if you know the value of the function at t equals 0, if you know the velocity of the function at t equal to 0, if you know the acceleration of the function at t equals 0, if you know the jerk of the function at t equals 0, which is third derivative. So if more and more information of present is known to us, if more and more information of present is known to us, with a very high degree of accuracy, you can predict the future. You know, what a wonderful statement by Taylor. Because if you know more about your present, the completely full detailed description about present will always lead to future prediction with higher degree of accuracy. And that's exactly when you even talk about s equals u t plus half at t square. So it simply tells, it's a machine which tells if you know the initial velocity, like initial state of the system, you know acceleration, which is the rule of the universe, like, uh, yes, which is rule of the game, rule of the gravitation. And then you have these coefficients to tell how those uh, distance acts and time is, you know, like something which is hand of, in the hand of cosmic existence. It's a one-way one -way traffic, right? So if you know the present situation, you can easily predict the future of the particle. That's what about fundamentally all equations is telling. And it's no wonder the Taylor series is a gateway to your sigma f external equals mass times acceleration of the system. Because if the initial condition, which means displacement, velocity, and acceleration of particle is known to a very high degree of accuracy, we can predict the displacement of particle at any other time. Of course, that formula is if you want to make it more perfect, you have to incorporate more information at the present. For example, third derivative, fourth derivative, fourth derivative, fifth derivative, and so on and so forth. But usually for a natural observation, or at least in, for the Newtonian mechanics or observable universe, uh, we predict the outcome of the universe mostly with the acceleration part for fairly good number of experiments. I hope it made sense and you must have enjoyed this and we'll meet with more interesting lectures in future too. Until then, take care.